start the recording now. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> sounds good. Okay, so I'm just gonna go, uh, gonna do a, a short intro, and and then I'll I'll make you presenter. Have you got a a, a presentation? You want to share something, or are you just gonna talk? Well, I'll just talk. How does it work with the questions? Uh, okay, well, I'm just gonna talk. Will Will there be people asking questions, or how will it go? Yeah, what I thought of doing is on the web on the go to webinar, there is a facility that people can can send chat messages. So I will ask them um, to to ask their question in the chat messages, and I will I will keep track of that, and I will uh, uh, put it in a little uh, file, and and then afterwards uh, you can go through the questions. Is that fine with you? Yeah, no, that's great. I didn't do a presentation. I, I thought maybe it was just a chat. So uh, let me let me start just by talking about legislation. And the minute that you get a question, we can interrupt and go okay. back and do do what. Okay. Make it a bit interactive. Okay. Okay. So, so let's let's just start. So um, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sherilyn, for joining us. Uh, Sherilyn is. Uh, is a member of parliament. She is. Uh, she was with, the, uh, or she is still with the African Democratic Party, and she's been in the National Assembly since June 1999, and she's been the uh, ACDP parliamentary whip. Uh, uh, that always uh, um, sounds very aggressive to be a whip. And maybe you can also <laughs> give us a short explanation what a whip is exactly. Um, she has served in many portfolio committees, uh, and one of them is basic education. I think she's got a, a passion for education, and um, where uh, most political parties are not interested in home education, uh, Sherilyn has been very helpful in, in um, promoting the course of, of home education because she posted a few questions to the minister to which we got replies and I think it was thanks to those questions uh, that the associations and all kinds of stakeholders were uh, involved in the meetings with the Department of Education. Um, Sherilyn, I think currently you are our chief whip of all the small opposition parties and um, and what Sherilyn has achieved is she was the first uh, member of parliament to actually pass the first private bill. So uh, we are going to talk about how does a bill become a law. So uh, a bill is sort of a proposed law. In Afrikaans, it's a wetsontwerp. And, and bills can be submitted by either ministers or member of parliament. And if it's submitted by member of parliament, then it's a private bill. So uh, she managed to get the first private bill um, uh, voted in, well, uh, approved by Parliament. So if there's somebody that knows how a bill becomes a law, it is she. And um, yeah, and 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 lastly, she is married and has four children between the ages 43 and 23, and I think that is a is, is a good thing for homeschoolers because we often deal with people that uh, that um, determine policy and stuff that they don't even have children themselves. So uh, thank you very much, Sherilyn, for joining us. And I'm going to, well, I don't think I need to make you a presenter if you're not going to present anything. So I'm just going to go <laughs> sure. go on mute and and you can. Uh, and you can uh, start talking. And um, if anybody's got a question, put it in the chat window, and uh, and then um, uh, I can interrupt or so something. Or maybe, yeah, Cheryl, yeah. if you if you if you ha if you've got a little dashboard, maybe do you see any stuff in the chat window? I will put something there quickly. I, I, I'm quite happy if you inter interrupt. Okay, it's good. Then, then that could work so we can feel like we're interacting. It'll be good. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. So, so should I go ahead? Hi. You can go Hi, ahead. Hi, everybody. Great to be here with you. Thank you 
so much for this opportunity. Obviously, this is a bit of a test, so hopefully when we do this again, uh, we'll know what, what you guys are really wanting. Um, as was just mentioned about having children, I've also got uh, four grandchildren and a fifth one on the way, so the homeschooling thing's probably, probably even closer to home than, than we think. But I think what I'd like to start off with is I've, I've been in the African Christian Democratic Party since um, 1993 and in Parliament since 1999. So um, it's been quite a distance that we've come and we've always championed homeschooling and, and the rights of homeschoolers. And it's, it's something that is close to our heart. And I think sometimes there is a bit of confusion um, and that, that confusion's come in purely because um, there's, you, when I'm dealing with these issues, there's two things. I look at it um, from two sides. The one is our stand, you know, um, at, at a time when Christians really, really get the understanding that unless they vote for an ACDP government, they're not going to have people who understand how important this is. Um, to, to families, um, the right for people to actually educate their children the way they want to educate their children. So while people are voting differently, now we have to decide we have what we have. And with that kind of government in place, we have, you know, so I often will advise people um, that when we have a certain situation, we can't act as if we have a government that is um, going to understand our worldview. So we need to take what we have and, and, and I usually advise people to behave a little differently so that we can get the best that we can get in this scenario until people are voting differently. And I think that's where people th get to think, oh, well, we're not as passionate about about it. It's not about that. It's about not wanting to um, blow the issue out of the water and to get what we can get while we're in this difficult situation until, uh, until as I say, we can do something where, uh, where an ACD government can be fully supportive of people's rights in this area. Now, just to talk a little about, uh, about the laws, obviously the National Assembly is where I've been since the 1999, it's almost 19 years. Um, and, and that is... Um, the National Assembly is a legislative body. In fact, um, there's two parts to Parliament, and that is the National Assembly and the NCOP, the National Council of Provinces, and both are involved with making legislation. It is a primary function, and um, both houses are involved on um, most of the laws, and most laws can start in either house. Uh, um, usually they begin in the National Assembly and they go and, and a law has to pass from the one to the other. So it's a double process. And what's good about that double process, um, particularly where those laws affect different provinces, um, is that, that the public actually gets then two opportunities for this public uh, participation in terms of um, public hearings, um, making written and, and oral submissions, and, and for people's voice to be heard. If a, a piece of legislation then is passed through, say it started in the National Assembly and it gets passed by the National Assembly, it will then go to the NCOP and that whole process starts again with a greater emphasis on the provincial um, viewpoint. So, so that that's sort of generally um, how, part of how how the um, process works in terms of legislation. Uh, mostly, it would be a minister who who um, initiates uh, legislation and. And that would go, so she would put, or he would put that uh, through the department, the drafting would be done there, there would be a certain amount of public participation there. Um, then it comes, then they would table it at Parliament. Once it's tabled at Parliament, it gets sent to the relevant committee. Then you, you wait for that relevant committee to actually put it onto their program for the year. And of course, a year in, in Parliament is so tight um, with all of the things that have to be done. So it's really important that it it finds its slot there. And then the, the, the committee starts its work in terms of interrogating, well, first of all, having briefings by the department on what, um, what the department's thinking was, what the objectives are, what they're trying to achieve. And then, of course, the committee starts to interrogate, will what you've written here achieve those objectives? Um, the objectives usually are in line, obviously, with the majority party's policy conferences, and, and that's just a given. Um, so, so we've had to learn, obviously, with any things that we see that we'd like to see different in that legislation, we have to be able to kind of work it so that we can present it in a way that, it, that it's 
it's going to meet the needs of, of whatever was decided in that policy conference um, in a better way if we actually consider changing these words and, and, and whatever. So you've got to be a little strategic and, and really um, understand the people that you, you're working with on the committee in terms of where their thinking is, particularly the majority, because obviously a minority does not vote through any legislation. It is always the majority that actually votes through. So our job is to convince that majority that what we want to see changed is beneficial for them as well. So I, I, I was thinking, you know, obviously a lot of this um, started in terms of the um, Bella bill, um, a people's interest because of um, feeling concerned that some of those clauses in the Bella bill were going to be problematic for, for homeschooling um, parents and uh, other stakeholders. And then also it was clearly even a, a concern for, for schools as well um, with governing bodies, etc. And I think people wanted to know a little about where the process was in terms of that bill. Um, so, so that's important. Now, what, what is really important to understand is um, that bill is not at Parliament. That bill is still in its draft form and it's still in the department. So we as members of Parliament do not have anything to do with that bill at this stage. Um, while it's with the department, there's a little bit of confusion there because just as a courtesy, because it's a con controversial uh, bill, um, the department actually did come to the committee to brief them. So not to put the bill <laughs> with Parliament, but just to give them an idea of what they're working on, what the public process threw up, what the issues are, and, and, and just to bring that committee a little on board with what's coming. So you can be, you can rest assured that that, that bill now has gone back um, within the department and all of the um, input that people made, and people made an amazing amount of input, um, which was really well done everybody for, for, for getting, um, well, for, for being on the alert, first of all, and actually responding the way you did. And the department has promised that they will, they will be looking at every last bit of input that came through and trying to see where um, any of it fits and perhaps so so perhaps the bill when it does come to parliament could be a, a vastly different bill to what we saw um, when the department put it out for comment so it's not on the horizon as yet can I just crazy yeah. at the moment. Um, hmm. so I've, i was just thinking uh, normally when uh, i think there's a, a, a request for comment um they get a a few comments and then it's mm -hmm. you, you can work through those, those comments in a week uh, but now mm -hmm. suddenly they sit with about our estimate is from the homeschooling community there about a thousand letters and from the mm -hmm. from the model C uh, uh, they've got about 5,000 letters so so those are individual submissions and you must apply your mind to every one of them have you have you got an idea of what it takes to work through those things and really apply your mind to it? And I'm also thinking of the city of Cape Town that, that, that strictly speaking, has to work through 60,000 letters about the water tax. Um, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if government is geared to handle those amount of, of submissions. Well, I, I don't know how resourced they are at local government, but I do know that resources generally throughout are, are really tight. And so this is difficult. So those, those skilled key people in those jobs are few and far between. But those that are doing the job do it well. And they do it with a lot of experience and expertise in terms of this is what we've been doing um, since 94. So, so um, and in the department, they have their, their legal people and their administrative people who are, who will be looking at that. And what they do is they pull out the essence and the points and they put it together and, and then they put those things before so they so even when we're at parliament it'll be a similar sort of process of, of once everybody starts giving their input again and a whole new process starts and then the documents you get before and then that's why it's important when it gets to parliament to have members of parliament like myself um sitting in on those committees because then you can actually uh, in the deliberations it's very easy with so much input 
for people to miss certain stuff and focus on other things. But if a member's sitting there knowing this is important to my constituency, then we can say, but have you considered this person's input? Because remember, as an MP sitting there, people are not interested in what I want to see in that legislation. We're interested in what the, our constituents want to see in that legislation. And so we can actually then direct the conversation and the deliberations to focus on that, um, that um, submission in terms of a, a change to a clause or a, a removal of a clause or an addition of a clause, et cetera. So with the, with the submissions, the, the most valuable submissions are the ones that are really succinct, that are, that are really to the point that actually say, on this specific clause, it will have this unintended consequence or negative consequence for this reason um, I, we suggest either change an A or an I or a but or a T or a one word or remove the clause so it, it, the, the, less, the less you actually give um, in terms of the, the more you can work it so that there's the least change so that whatever, whatever reason it was there it's hopefully going to still sort out that problem but you need to take out just enough to get rid of the problem that's now causing the new problem um, and and so it's that kind of thing so sometimes it will be having to remove an entire clause or put another clause in its place or even just sometimes a word for example um, when we were working on the the wedgie bill which was a woman empowerment legislation it was going to be seriously disadvantaged uh, disadvantaging um, NGOs and churches and impacting them very negatively and then in, in scrutinizing that we, we discovered that actually if there's just a change of a definition if we change a certain definition it will take away that problem entirely and we managed to, I managed to argue there in the committees for, for that change of that definition. And whilst it was wonderful because people came in um, at the time of the hearings and gave submissions, and that was really important because once those um, suggestions are made on paper, then when I was sitting at the time of the deliberations, I could remind the committee there was that there was that suggestion that this is the unintended consequence. Now we know that not all of these things are unintended because there's many people with many agendas and there's people who want certain consequences. But remember that those people sitting on that committee are not necessarily, they don't have that agenda. They're not wanting any unintended, they're not wanting any consequences that are going to be negative to anybody. So if you take the view that those people on that committee don't want to see anybody disadvantaged and, and and we managed to argue it and we got that definition changed and it took away the problem so so these are the kind of things we look for is how to how to uh, change the least to make the biggest impact um, and and that's uh, and as you say with the volumes of stuff that's there um, the, the clearer people can be in terms of a, a, a specific change uh, the easier it is to actually push that through So, so yeah, so uh, yeah, I've got uh, some questions in the meantime. Um, so I think yeah. in summary, what you're saying is in your submission to try to be as concise and requ request as little as possible change to what's there already. Yes. Okay. I've given it a lot of thought in terms of because obviously big changes can actually take away the original goal to disadvantage other sections of society and, and you want to keep it where it's going to be the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay. Um, I think um, w one thing I th we, we would like to discuss is, Be okay, Bella Bill is now in the department and at some stage is going to land at Parliament and then it's going to go through a process and in that process there will be a number of opportunities for public participation um, and yes. can you maybe explain to me, us how that's going to work and how we can how we can ensure that we we are aware of it and we don't miss the opportunity etc all right so just to give you an idea of a time frame um, at the moment of course we, we we've sort of got all of these things happening at parliament with the changeover of the presidency um, and sona um, will be tomorrow the state of the nation address the the um, next week that will be debated and he will respond and the new president will respond the hope is that our, the budget will be presented at, on the wednesday as it should it's a possibility it may have to be postponed if 
um, the new uh, Minister of Finance is not ready. Um, and there, there is a sense that there could well be a new Minister of Finance. So, um, th th and that budget process is going to take a couple of, a good few weeks. In fact, it'll take till the 15th of April. So, um, we, 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 we can see that Parliament's going to be really tightly focused on budget issues until then. So even if that um, draft legislation comes to Parliament before then, it's certainly unlikely to be put into the programme of any of any of the committees until after that um, break, uh, the, the Easter break. So just to give you an idea that it, it wouldn't be before then. Once it's on the programme, the, the, the beginning phase would be the department coming to explain their bill, to, to, to brief the committee on whatever's in this new draft. Um, at that stage, then the, the committee decides this is something of great public interest. We're going to need to have hearings. They will then need to advertise it, and they also may, um, put out invitations um, for people to actually, for stakeholders to, to um, make their written submissions and also request if they want to make oral submissions. So usually it can be a day of hearings, it can be two days of hearings, and um, depending on, on how much response there is. And the committees, my, my experience of the committees is that they really do want to hear what the public have to say. You would then have a small uh, window of um, no longer than 20 minutes to present and have questions asked. So it would probably be about a 10 minute presentation and 10 minutes for people to ask you for clarity, et cetera, on your view. The importance of that is that that's captured. Um, also, you would be, with, with your submission, you would put it in writing and as, as the clearer you make that submission, um, the better because those, those experts working on it will be lifting that out and putting it into the document that members will use later on to deliberate on it. So once everybody's um, had their say and members have asked for clarity to get a sense of, of why people are thinking what they're thinking, um, then the deliberations. Then it's important, as I say, for a person like myself to be there in terms of a specific issue that we know that, that our constituency is concerned about so that we can draw the attention um, to those things so that they don't get missed out, so they really do get deliberated on. And we do um, hopefully manage to actually um, get the ear of a majority in terms of if any changes need to be made to improve um, whatever the wording is um, in that bill and make it so that it doesn't negatively impact on that constituency. Um, so, so, th so that would be the public process there. But of course, the committee deliberations would be open to people coming in and listening. Um, but once, of course, the hearing is over, then it's only members who speak. Uh, but people will be able to watch the process. Then, once the committee's finished with its work and they've made a, de a decision, it then goes to the National Assembly to be debated again. And in that debate, though, it's pretty much people will have decided in their caucuses as parties how they're going to vote, and the majority will have made their decision um, whether that legislation is going through or not. It is possible to send legislation back from the National Assembly to the committee for changes, but that, that pretty much never happens because that majority in the committee already are informed by their caucus, so they already have an understanding of how the collective wants to vote. Um, so so that's a, once it gets to the National Assembly, it's pretty much a done deal. If it goes through the National Assembly, which it usually goes through if it's got there, um, then it, go, it, it then goes from there onto the National Council of Provinces. The National Council of Provinces is put together as um, different provinces focusing um, on issues from their provincial perspective. So those MPs don't get to vote um, according to what they want to vote. They get to vote according to what their province has decided that they're going to vote. Um, but it's a, it's a good check and balance because obviously these things have different impacts sometimes in different provinces. Um, and there's a different... Um, constituents are more sort of uh, concerned in some provinces than they are in others. So um, when it gets to the NCOP, um, it will be, usually those hearings are taken to those different provinces. 
and and that's great because then it's um, at a national level it's people coming into the national sphere to, to give their input at a provincial level it's people in those provinces being able to give their input at a provincial level um, the department obviously is usually there to listen um, because there might be something they've missed and that they, they, they would consider themselves. But mostly it's about capturing that for the members of parliament to actually deliberate on, is there something here that we really need to change? Is there something that would make this better? Are we, are we, is this legislation doing what, uh, meeting the, um, the objectives? Is it, is it um, fulfilling um, or, or sorting out the problems <laughs> that it was meant to sort out um, in the first place? So that would be the double process. So it's at a national level and it goes to the various provinces. Um, if the NCOP want to make any suggestions in terms of changes, they do. Um, it comes back then to the National Assembly, the committee looks at it again, they look more closely at those recommendations and they can decide to, to change the legislation at that point. Or if they decide um, no, then they go into like an arbitration. Uh, at the end of the day though, the National Assembly gets to call the shots. So if, if they can't sort it out, the National Assembly carries the weight in terms of passing that legislation. Yes. Uh, so the bottom line is the majority in the National Assembly, um, whatever the decision there is, they will have their way. So the game is um, if, if you can't convince that majority that it's in their interests and in the interests of their constituents, you pretty much then have no, no shot at it. Um, is there a, in the province, when this thing is in the province, is there also a, a public participation process? Yes, so that's what would happen. So when it, it, when it goes to the NCOP, the, the different provinces then set up hearings in their provinces. And, and, and that is important. Um, that didn't happen. In fact, what's, what was really good was once on a, a choice on termination of pregnancy amendment, um, it skipped through um, that process and, and it was taken to court and the courts actually ordered for that to be uh, withdrawn and it had to start again because the public participation wasn't taken seriously enough. Um, so that was very, very helpful because now a member of parliament like myself can sit in those meetings and say, look, we can't push this through or, or, or just make light of these, this input because you know what happened with that court case and we don't have the money in parliament to actually, this, for this whole process to fall apart, for us to be in court processes and have court challenges. So that, that, that decision was very helpful in terms of ensuring that members of parliament are seen to really be applying their minds to all of the input that, that is there. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go through some questions here. Um, let's just go to the top one. Yeah. In the portfolio committee, you were adamant that the DBE process of public participation and the parliamentary process be kept separate. Why is this important? I assume that's well, somebody that attended the, the, the meeting. Yeah, I'm not too sure what they're referring to, but it, it, just hearing what you're saying, it makes me think in terms of like a lot of times people confuse the department with parliament and with government and with the ANC and all of these things are different. So you have the majority party and other parties who have their own policy conferences and they have their own policies. Right, now we know because the majority party are in government, those policies influence what happens in terms of the department. So now the, the department is made up of ministers who are part of the cabinet. That's the executive of, of the president. That's a different arm of, of government. Parliament is, is, so there's a separation of powers between the executive, which is the cabinet, and parliament. Um, and there's definitely a separation between the party and government, although we haven't always seen that over the years, they have got a little better at it as, as we've gone along. So um, government takes its own position, but it is influenced by the party policy. Then um, the department has its, is, is, is taking its instructions from their minister. 
they're drafting and then they come and ask Parliament, they table it, they ask us to deal with it. Then Parliament decides to deal with it by sending it to their committee and their committee interrogates it. So, the, But we invite the department to come and brief us on it. What's their goal? What's the aim? Because obviously, and then of course the majority sitting in that committee have an interest in that government because it's from their same party. Um, <laughs> passing as much legislation as it can in terms of whatever its goals and, and, and its, its objectives are. So um, it, it's sort of linked in that sense, but there's a very strong, um, in fact, Parliament is really strong in all parties and particularly these days, the majority party, to make sure that the department does not get confused and think that members of Parliament are there to rubber stamp anything they put in front of us. Because Parliament is there to see that the people of South Africa's voice is heard and that we capture what they're asking for and that that's in the legislation. So there is a, a so Parliament was in the early days in a much weaker place than it is now. It is much stronger in terms of being able to hold its own in, uh, and a greater set, um, oversight over the executive and a greater sense of holding the executive to account so that we actually are, um, uh, yes, yeah, so that we are a definite strong check and balance there on the executive. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, how long, if you just, uh, um, just a guesstimate, how long do you think will it take for Bellable to pass? So, um, we don't know how long uh, the department will take to review it, but let's say it ends in Parliament April or something. And, and, and how long from there will it take to become a law? Okay. Now, I, I know I'm in the business of foretelling <laughs> the future, so, so I'm not saying that this is what it will be. But if you ask me, I cannot see it going through before the next election. And, you know, Parliament is a five-year term. So Parliament opens at the beginning of a, fi a five-year term, and then it closes at the end of that. At the end of that, any business that's still alive falls away and it has to be restarted again. Somebody has to actually um, reactivate it again if they still want that legislation to go through. So because we've got to go through the process in two houses and because this is a contentious issue and there's a lot of public interest, there's no ways it can be rushed. So with us now focusing um, with all of the disruptions we've had at the beginning of this year and uh, we need to focus on the budget because without the budget going through south africa is going to collapse um, so um, we know that this can't come until at sort of april may june um, then parliament only has half a year and usually before an election year towards that, that, that year is usually a bit of a short year before we go into the next year and all they do the next year is budget stuff and not too much legislation because parties need time to get themselves organized to, to meet the election. So there's so little time that I doubt that there's even time to get it through the National Assembly, let alone through the National Assembly and through the NCOP. So I think we're going to see this um, legislation have to be um, reinstated uh, in, in 2019, when, when the new parliament forms. Okay, thank you. That's if, uh, that, that's if it even gets to parliament uh, now, this year. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just might not, there may be other priorities. Yeah, well, let's, we, we're not in a rush, so... Um, Okay, um, next one, uh, is it, I think it relates to this question, is it possible for a bill to be dropped, in other words, not to send it Parliament at all? And I think that relates to another question I've seen here, is um, with the new president, and maybe he will announce a new cabinet, uh, there's a chance that we'll have a new Minister of Education, and, and, and could that cause this bill to be dropped from the radar? Well, there's two ways of looking at that. The one is, um, since it's the ANC policy conference that informs what legislation is coming through those departments, it's not likely to be off their agenda until in the new policy conference and people um, in the majority are, are saying something different. But 
Um, it is a great possibility, for example, um, on other things that have been very contentious, like the end of life bill. That was around when I actually got to Parliament 19 years ago. And we we made that extremely controversial. And we hit on that subject constantly and um, bringing up all kinds of issues that we thought were very relevant at the time, like, for example, what are we saying? That there's no quality of life if you've got AIDS. Are we just going to kill everybody? You know, is everybody going to just sort of just feel that they have a no option but to, to end their lives? So, so those kind of arguments kept it controversial and 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 so so a lot of what's been going on now in terms of people um, creating some controversy over the Bella Bill is very good because if it is too contentious within the ANC it could be shelved so it will hang around in the wings and for who, for who knows for how long or those problematic clauses get changed so I think it is important the public participation aspect ha has a big influence on whether uh, it's too much of a hot potato, um, and I'm, I'm thinking pe people, everybody has shown that this before the next election maybe is not a not not uh, something that they want to bite off <laughs> right now, um, being contentious. Okay, thank you. So the next one is: um, Will I be able to homeschool my children? No. Will I be able to unschool my children in South Africa for the next 20 years with no issues from government. Um, I think, yeah, that is very difficult to answer, I assume. If the Bella Bull goes ahead as it is currently, uh, and you want to keep to the, uh, yet stick to the law, and it's not challenged in court and says, uh, put aside by the courts, then, um, yeah, unschooling would be difficult. Have you got anything to comment there? Look, I, I, I'm not... I'm not familiar with the term unschooling. Obviously, um, I would caution against that kind of talk because it, I mean, if it scares someone like me who's, who's really pro <laughs> homeschooling, I mean, it will scare people who are not pro homeschooling. So I think unschooling would tend to give people a sense. Of, uh, if this is an important word and we need to understand the value of unschooling, then maybe we need a bit of an education go uh, the campaign going on. But Remember, um, globally, we are all committed to every child has a right to an education. Now, of course, there are those people who feel that they don't want to educate their children the way other people are educated. So there has to be some kind of, and you find that when courts decide these things, they talk about what would the rational man um, be be thinking, um, what would what would be um, what would be rational? What's the, what's the, what's what's the word that they use? Reasonable the man. man no. the, the what? Reasonable man. The reasonable man. <laughs> the reasonable man. So so um, if something were to be decided in court, it would be decided on the basis of whether it's reasonable. So if it's if it's not seen as in the 21st century reasonable for children not to have access to the basics of education. Um, then the, you know, then we'd have a problem there. But if we, if if unschooling means something quite different, uh, then then perhaps we need to we, we need to get to grips with it so that we're ready for that um, to put that case. And um, so, but what we what we don't want to see, and I don't think what nobody wants to see, is what is happening is that children who have got parents who have got issues, like for example, dependence on alcohol or drugs and other things. Um, depression, things where people are not getting the help that they need and children are falling through the cracks. Now, we don't want children to fall through the cracks and not have the opportunities in life that other children are having. So, so we, we've got, so a government has a responsibility to make sure that um, there is some kind of uh, method to be able to check that children are accessing schooling and at schooling of a, uh, of a fair standard. Um, and in fact, we, we want more than a fair standard um, for our children. So I think homeschooling is going to be in their, their best interests to really present homeschooling in the most, in a way that it's extremely reasonable and that it is, it is a preferred education. It's an, it, it's, it's an education plus. Um, and, and that's going to be our best way of, of actually arguing for homeschoolers to have the greatest freedom in terms of choosing the curriculum, et cetera, for their children. 
Yeah, no, I, I think uh, um, I personally try to avoid the term unschooling because um, not that I'm against unschooling, but I think the term scares a lot of people. But somebody else yeah. uh, ha has worked out a fantastic term. It's called uncapped education. So it's uh, it's got two, um, uh, two components. One, it's unlimited. And the second one, it's not, it's not restricted by the CAPS curriculum. So uh, that's, uh, I think, a, a, a nice term. Um, the next... And I think homeschooling, homeschoolers are amazing. And, and, and they're obviously going to be, um, they the people who can be the most creative in terms of understanding. Well, let's take CAPS. That's a basic. And let's uncap it ourselves because we can add on to that because that's that's where other children are disadvantaged when they don't have parents they don't have the kind of home structures that they are there um so now so homeschooling so instead of fighting for this uh, against this minimum basic take the minimum basic and then make it everything that it needs to be on top um, because if we just stick at fighting not having a minimum basic um, we're really keeping ourselves from actually reaching those heights that we want to reach, w would be my advice um, in terms of working with a mindset of people who are fully embracing um, the, the kind of global thinking that there is, which isn't a biblical worldview. It isn't a family centered worldview. It, it, so, so these are things that we have to take in mind. We have to know how to take what is and make it what we want it to be. Thank you. Um, then there are two questions again. It's about how long it will take. I think you've already discussed that. Um, now there's another one. If a private law, private bill can pass, can the trust, I assume there's a Pestalozzi trust, then bring a law to be passed that stops the DOE to inferior uh, with homes, interfere with homeschool? Um, yeah, I think. Uh, let, let's just make it a broader question, say, um, it can um, the homeschooling movement engage with political parliament uh, parties or with parliamentarians and, and, and discuss possible private bills? Is, is that a possibility? Yeah, definitely. Now, my experience with the one bill being the only bill that's ever, uh, private members bill that's ever passed through parliament, that was a four-year project and fortunately I started that right at the beginning of a new parliament <laughs> so it actually went went the distance within that time so my recommendation would be that prior to the new parliament forming um, perhaps have made your connection with the members of parliament who who have some um, empathy and with you with your position in terms of uh, getting a sense of what's right but then the idea there is that that member of parliament would understand the environment that they're working in. Um, some parties would just use it to make a, a political statement with no hope of anything changing. Um, and that it, it wastes a lot of the um, law advisor's time and, and everybody's time. But for them, it can be worth it because it can make people feel they're making a noise and all the drama about it. And maybe the conversation is an important conversation to have and therefore it's, it's, it's valuable. Um, but for me, the issues that I've been dealing with, I actually wanted to see some change. So, so I was being, uh, you know, obviously observing Parliament, observing the people I work with on committees over the many, many years, plus my experience of trying to pass other private members' bills. I, I've realized if you want actually to make any change, you, you kind of need to work within the space that that you get and so it's not a case of just saying we want to null and void everything that was decided at the ANC policy conference because that's not going to happen because you don't have that power but what you do have is the power to take those things that have been decided and say but we can make this better we you can get this result without disadvantaging this section of people um, if we just change this and do that and it won't disadvantage us. So you really work, if you've got to work very cleverly if you really want to make a change. So, so just to put that simply, yes, um, no one can actually pass that bill, except draft that bill and present it to Parliament except 
um, the department or a member of parliament or a committee of parliament. Those are the three, uh, because that's what parliament is about. So a Pestalozzi trust can't do that, but a Pestalozzi trust could have an idea that this would be an amendment we'd like to make to this legislation. Now, presenting a whole wish list is just going to shut everybody down and just close it off. But looking carefully at, okay, there's so much we that we know that we can't do. But what could we do? What is constitutional? And remember, it would have to be constitutional. It would have to pass the constitution. So, so no private member's bill gets, uh, if it doesn't get signed off as constitutional by the law advisors, then once it gets to its first um, site in a committee, the first thing that they ask the law advisor, is it constitutional? And she's, he or she says no it's done, it's out. There's no ways we're going to waste our time on unconstitutional legislation. So um, so people with a different worldview to you, if you really want to make um, a, a difference, you, you need to actually make the changes you can change and not necessarily try and make the changes you can't change. What, to make the bigger changes, what you have to do is mobilize people, organize, make sure that they understand that unless you vote for a certain party, you're not going to have people thinking like you. But if you can get people to, to if, if you believe you've got the majority numbers who think alike, then they must vote for a party who thinks like them. And then you will have a greater openness to those, the, those bigger changes um, that your constituency would want to see. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. So uh, we'll start working on that. Um, I think we already had some good, good. discussions on that. Um, the, here's a question of, so we've been making submissions to uh, the department, um, uh, to the policy as or to the uh, uh, bill as well as the policy. And here's a question is, what is the weight of a submission uh, of an individual versus an association? So you will see on the SA Homeschoolers website, there are all the submissions of the associations are there, but there are thousands of individuals. Is there any difference there? Look, there should be a greater weight in terms of the, in the, the collective because of the numbers behind that thinking. But I have to say that the, the majority party that I know puts a lot of store by the individual, the one. Um, input by the one person. So if people see uh, submissions coming in and everyone is the same few lines, they just feel, okay, no, this has just been fed to people. It's a, it's a mindset. It's, a, it's not really what people are thinking. They're just doing what they told. But if people are actually look like they've grappled with something themselves, even if it's two lines, but it's coming from the heart of somebody, um, the, 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 a lot of attention is paid to that. So it's a balance. I think uh, on the one hand, you want to give a sense of numbers of many people behind this thinking. So that is important for those organizations to put their submission, but then not to stop the individuals saying, no, this is important to me because it affects me and my family and, you know, and, and trying to express it in their own words. There, there is a great respect for, for the individual. Thank you. Um, I think here uh, the next one is there anything we can do while the bill goes the bill goes through its motions? I think we have covered that in terms of we 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 must get involved when there are opportunities for public participation. Um, but I've got something I want to add. Yeah. Yeah. You you can be preparing now um, for when it gets to Parliament, so that the submissions can be made quickly. Okay. Um, we, um, the homeschooling movement is also an international movement. So um, there is an international um, gl or global home education conference that's happening in May in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. And, and we've got lots of uh, links to international organizations. At, at what part of the process do you think is international uh, lobbying uh, effective? So what we typically do, for example, when we assist um, homeschoolers that are per, uh, persecuted in other countries, as South Africans, for example, we send lots of letters to the, currently, for example, there is a case in Norway. 
So what we want to organize is let, let's get lots of parents to write letters to the Norwegian embassy uh, to put pressure on the Norwegian government to um, stop prosecuting uh, that family. Um, but in terms of the Bella Bill, at what stage do you think is international pressure uh, most effective? Uh, yeah, I, I think that international pressure could be effective once the, the bill, the, the new draft bill comes from the department and is tabled in parliament, then you know that is what the members will be working with. And I think that's an important place where if, if there's a specific clause that you uh, feel that all of the representations, for example, that were made were saying that that was problematic and now nothing's changed there, th th then that's obviously a clear sign that people are unwilling from the department side to change that. So you know that that's going to be a sticky area. Um, but to presume it won't change now is, is not necessary because it may change and there is a commitment to looking at those things. But the minute you see it hasn't changed, um, and obviously you need to also decide, you know, if, if it's changed some, perhaps that's a really important thing because you're not going to get it in this day and age to change more unless you have a different government in, in, in um, authority. So, um, it would be wise to decide if it's changed some and it makes it better, maybe we want to get behind that and make sure that it stays like that and it doesn't go revert back to where it was. Or you might want to say, okay, no, it's all or nothing. We want the great thing. And then you can actually get um, pressure from perhaps um, others to, to, to write and there's international pressure. But it would pretty much, unless it's a, a really serious human rights violation, but of course it can be if it's, if it's a, um, anything to do with clamping down on a person's religious freedom um, or their freedom to believe or their freedom not to believe, you know, whatever. That is a, a, of global interest. There are organizations, I'm part of a, a, a group of people who are actually members of parliament um, called, it's a panel of uh, parliamentarians for freedom of religion and belief. So that's the freedom to believe and the freedom not to believe. But that, that, would, that sort of group would also look at wanting to send letters to, um, to the embassies of certain companies Companies, if, if countries, if they thought that um, people's rights were being curtailed in terms of, of, of these things. But again, the, the more rational, the more reasonable, the more that you can, you can actually set, know that that argument would also pass the, the reasonable test in terms of a court, the greater chance you have of somebody listening and finding the, the, uh, the issue credible. Thank you. Um, next question is, is the nation as a national assembly pro homeschooling or not? So I think it's a question of what do you think is the general feeling about homeschooling in the national assembly? I think the majority of people in the national assembly representing the majority of people in the nation are actually um, sort of concerned that in, in and more so previously than now, that homeschooling was, because I think threats have come from people who have been involved in homeschooling, that they want to undermine government through homeschooling and teaching their kids and, and pretty much a rebellious kind of talk. And that, and that, so that talk has put people a little on guard and given them a bit of a negative sense. But I, but I don't think there's a, um, in terms of the uh, national level of, of, uh, that that there would be uh, a problem with the fundamentals of homeschooling. The problem is with the children who fall through the cracks and no registration. That's where the problem lies because if there's some form of registration, then you know, okay, those kids, but they've registered for homeschooling uh, and we know where, where they are and we know to, to throw an eye there and we can tell if there's problems um, that that they're, that they're not having any schooling at all. So, uh, and, and that's, I think, part of the difficulty that homeschoolers are having is that idea that they want nobody checking up on them. And the thing is, if you don't check up on, they may not need checking up on. 
<laughs> but but there are other people who do need checking up on. Otherwise, those kids are seriously disadvantaged. So these are the things we have to work out. And most countries in the world have been pretty reasonable um, about feeling um, confident that homeschooling is not a threat, the more people actually are prepared to register, then you know, well, those kids are in some kind of schooling. We know that there's a, a series that those people are linked to this kind of curriculum, this education, whatever. And there's not a feeling that that the government has to even um, explain itself to the world globally in terms of why it's not actually um, finding it important to make sure that every child is in school and that every child is getting at least a, de a basic standard of education. Thank you. So the questions just continue to rolling in. Um, one, I think this one you've already addressed. Does the committee debate whether a bill is constitutional or not? I think you mentioned there is a there is um, some kind of legal committee uh, that that checks the constitutionality. So it uh, you won't. Well, let, well, let, let me say that again. Um, right at the beginning of the drafting of the bill, there would ha it would have to be signed off as constitutional in terms of the, the, those lawyers that have been working on the drafting of that bill. But that doesn't mean it is. That means that in their opinion, it is. So it goes the first step. If in their opinion it's not, it wouldn't get to be discussed in the, in the, in the, the legislature. If they're of the opinion that it is, then the discussions start about whether it really is. And, and that is what um, members of parliament will be discussing. They'll say, this is constitutional, this is unconstitutional. And if something, if, if you can argue well enough and convince the majority, that this is not going to pass uh, the, the test of constitutionality in, in a constitutional court, um, then you're on good ground. So th that's the kind of place that you're going to look even, you know, in terms of your constituency and, and wanting to um, make certain changes to clauses. We want to look at um, how can this be offensive to the constitution and how can we argue it, not in a way that we're making the majority the enemy, how can we convince the majority we're not their enemy and that and that this change is good for the majority of people plus good for this homeschool community you get what i'm saying thank you very much um okay next one on constitutionality the dg asked if parliament and the dbe could have joint hearings to save money i think was that uh DG is the director general, that, so that was probably asked during that committee meeting. Can you recall anything about oh, that? Yes, that, 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 that was where people say, what are you smoking? <laughs> because, the, because the department, um, there's no way that parliament would agree to something like that, because that's basically the executive now taking over the function of parliament, and that they cannot do. Our job is to be an oversight of the executive. So when the executive comes and asks us to pass a certain law, we are there to put everything in place to check that we want that law in this country. So we're not linked to the department. The department is the executive. Um, the only link is that there's people in the executive who belong to the majority party and there's people in parliament who belong to the majority party and they're both informed by the policy conference of that majority party. But their jobs are completely different. The executive is there to, to decide what the agenda is and to interpret those policies and, and how they're going to form certain legislation and how they're going to be um, implemented. And then um, Parliament comes to say, but this is what the people are saying. How does this, is this really something that's answering the cry of the people or is it something that's answering some other kind of cry? And so, so our job is very different. So, so Parliament would never accept having department and uh, parliamentary hearings all in one. We would sit in on department hearings or the department can sit in on our hearings, but they could, they can't merge. There's definitely a separation. Have we been cut off? Sorry, I was muted. No. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> So I just skipped two questions. Uh, somebody says it would be great to have a mind map of all these different parties. Yeah, maybe uh, we are making a recording of this. So if somebody 
uh, wants to make a mind map, they can listen to the recording and, and then distribute it. That would be great. But I think we don't have time to right. do that now. Uh, next one, what is the best way to present a case to a parliamentary committee through a lawyer or expert that represents many distilled opinions or a personal impact story? What value does research have that has been commissioned by interested parties? What would be the best way to start lobbying ANC politicians and educating? Oh, good. By, um, <laughs> by making it's sure that it's my clever any... questions. Is the... <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you know any of, the, of your constituents that are actually in the ANC, then they must go to their branches and they must put this on the agenda and they must make sure this issue gets to the ANC conference and that they're passionate about it. So, so there's a place for your constituency within the ANC to actually be active and make sure that the issues arrive there in that party. But the same goes for whichever party people are in. Um, people need to know that if, if your party, if you're in that party and that party is not making your issue something that's important and it's going to become part of their policy, then you're going to vote for another party because that par a party that is interested in, in, in you having the maximum freedom in terms of, of what, what you value. And, and that's the only real big base, uh, final check and balance is to say, put the pressure on your party. When you, when you see that, and look, in fact, even now saying that is crazy because you already know that there is no other party other than the, the ACDP and maybe the Freedom Front if they're around um, in, in time to come. Um, but again, people see the Freedom Front as very much a small closed grouping. So you need a party that could potentially be the government of, of the country. And, and, and this, this, this is important. Um, if you if you are the majority and you've got the potential to be the majority, um, you need to have people who are like-minded um, on the issues you that are important to you. You need to put them into government, and you need to put them in 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 a framework that allows them to actually consider these issues with that um, w biblical worldview informing um, that thinking. Thank so, you. So, so what can people People can be active, they can put the pressure on their parties, and if those parties don't respond, and a good test would be, go to your, uh, you know, <laughs> people were so jealous when this bill went through in terms of the paternity leave, but I can tell you, I, I am pretty sure that people had been lobbied before about paternity leave, but no other member of parliament was interested, they only got interested when they realized that I managed to get the unions behind it because it's a working man's and, and women's issue. This is this is what working people have to face. When every time they have children, they, they, they can't be anywhere near where that child is being born and they and, and they they have to be separated from family and then they've got greater family issues and, and those kind of things. So so you, you, we need to to um, put the pressure on those parties when those parties don't respond. Take it to the other party. Take it to the party that does respond, and that part. But but you, you, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't support that party all the way to getting into government. Because if you don't do that, you're going to sit with the same issues again the next week, the next year, etc. The next parliament. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now a difficult one. How can we use Elon Musk and his view on homeschooling and unschooling to our advantage? Uh, does that sort of Elon Musk carry a lot of weight in Parliament? <laughs> can, you say, can you explain to me what that is? <laughs> <laughs> no, Elon Musk, you know, obviously know who Elon Musk is, but he made some statements about that he's going to homeschool his children. He was actually in a school, but he wants to homeschool his children. Um, so he... He wasn't in a school. No, he <laughs> was in a school... <laughs> Uh, he actually in yeah. Pretoria Boys High or something, I think. But he, he yeah, publicly yeah. said that he, he, he wants to home educate his school and he actually wants to use the unschooling approach. Um, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to ask people to educate me on this uh, unschooling thing. Okay. <laughs> but Let's... basically, um, I, I, I think that he needs to be as free as possible to do that because clearly something is informing him. But the interests of his children... Um, um, you would hope are 
really um, at, at the forefront of any parent's thinking, but it's not a fact and it's not, it's not the case in South Africa or in the world um, generally. There's an awful lot of parents who are not putting the interests of their children first. So, so we, th there has to be some um, checks and balances on these things. And basically, um, we want the least amount of interference in terms of families making those kind of decisions. So the more, as I say, the more reasonable we make our approach to these things the more carefully they the more easily they can be understood and not misinterpreted as something that's going to actually disadvantage people we have to remember not everybody has perhaps evolved to where some of the unschooling people have evolved to <laughs> and so the, they need to take the rest of us along with us or along with them in their thinking so that we can be um, sure that, that there's a safety net and that we're not actually leading people into something dangerous. So baby steps. And if we really want to see the greatest freedom in, in the area of, of um, no interference in, in uh, parents' decisions about their children, then, then it, it's going to be good for us to help people have that kind of confidence in us in terms of being reasonable, reliable, responsible, and, um, and putting our children first. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, just clarifying, uh, you had the, you discussed this about the the weight of individual submissions versus uh, group representatives. Uh, this question is: when there is a public hearing, uh, is there a difference in terms of individual and and, and associations? When there's a public hearing, um, only in the fact that. Um, an organization can speak about the numbers they represent. But remember, people don't always represent honestly those numbers. So there's a little bit of a skepticism in terms of members of parliament. We, we, we can't help but be skeptics because we've seen and heard <laughs> an awful lot of all sorts. So, um, and our job is also to interrogate these things. So the, the numbers, yes, 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 we know that you think you represent certain numbers of people. Um, but actually, we want to hear individuals speaking um, in terms of how it impacts on them and how important it is. And they can talk about being part of a collective and part of other, and other people being the same. But I think, um, I think both are important. Both are important. It is good to get together and then that, because also there's people with different skills when there's an organization and that there's those that will collect the information and there's those that will get it out and there's those that will be able to draft things and help other people to be to respond. Um, but I think the more that that response can seem like individuals responding, um, it, it's great. The, 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 the only the benefit would be that if a, an organization's doing it, they would have possibly access to things like um, lawyers, um, which means that and, and lawyers who have got some experience in terms of the issues that you're talking about, because then the submission can also be accurate. In other words, it's not just a floaty. I like this or I don't like that. Um, it, it is saying this this clause will have this impact on people. Um, for it not to have that negative impact, uh, we could change this word or take the clause out and replace it with this clause, but just whatever. So to work out um, a change so that it doesn't totally change the essence of whatever the department's trying to do. Because remember, what the department's generally trying to do is implement the majority's policy. Now, we have to convince them, if we want a chance of changing it, that that's not actually going to be the best thing in terms of implementing that policy. Or you can implement that policy and at the same time not negatively influence this, uh, impact this community if we just change that word and then everybody wins. You, you, you know, it's that, it's that kind of, um, as I say, that is my advice in terms of the situation we have now. That doesn't stop people organizing through those organizations in terms of saying, if, if, if we want these broader policy changes, who are we going to get behind that we know has those same policy ideas and that we can make sure that that becomes the government, that that is the majority and it will express the will of 
the majority. Um, and, it, it, and it doesn't have to even become the majority because the more, the, the more support um, that you have in terms of people, a voice in parliament, there is um, a lot of, um, what should I say, um, we, we know, I mean, we're only three in the ACDP and, and, and we know how much we have managed to influence legislation um, and more so the longer we've been here in terms of understanding um, the people that we're working with and, and how to actually um, not treat them as the enemy, but actually come, come from the point of view that we want to make it better for them as well as for our constituents. Thank you. I um, I think you've already answered a few the next questions. I think there's a question here is I think part of the issue is that the DOE doesn't understand how we home educate. I think that is a, a very general thing. Home education is very different from school education and when you Talk about people and you know, it's not only the department or the parliament or just family. Uh, um, they think as home education, as school is home, and then they, they misunderstand it. So there's a big gap there. So the question is, how can we educate those people? Um, yeah, so well, there, there, really that they're answering their own question in the sense that yes, education is important. The more we can all understand about each other's thinking, the less threatening that thinking will be. Um, but there's also the other answer would be little by little. You know, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. So what, what, what and that's what I'm pretty much suggesting is that while people don't understand homeschooling, then let's find what part they could understand and let's make sure we keep that space for ourselves and then we find the next part that they understand we keep that space so that so that in other words you won't necessarily change everything and you're certainly not going to change the, the the entire anc policy conference decisions unless you're in those ANC branches and you're going to <laughs> give the input that you need to give so um let's do it one bite at a time Let's figure out what we can change and what we can hold on to and make sure that we, we put our energies into that and incrementally do that. Because And then whilst you're educating, whilst we're making this open, freer, less threatening, helping people to understand the value of, of homeschooling and then push for that a little bit more and then a little bit more, et cetera, et cetera, as, as, we, as we go. Thank you. So... Um... I think you've so the word no one wants to hear is compromise. <laughs> so in the beginning, there will be a degree of compromise. Everybody hates that word. But yeah. I always say to people, you know, look, if my husband and I didn't compromise, we'd have killed each other long ago. You know? So compromise is not a bad thing altogether. So uh, and then as you get older, you grow closer together and use less compromise. So, so the important thing is, while we know we're so far apart on these things, let's figure out how we can find that middle ground and then start pushing for more and more so so i think somebody uh, a, a, a task for somebody that's interested is let's go and study the anc policy on education and see how we can achieve the goals of the anc by means of home education absolutely you got it <laughs> you got it and and then come find me and then we we work on a private member school. if you put me back yeah, in 2019, I'll do that for you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, next one is, uh, somebody says, are you aware of Operation Pakisa? Yes. Okay. Have you got any comment on that? Should we be concerned about it? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I'm quite excited about it. So if you do have any concerns, let me know what they are so, so that I can ask the right questions. Um, but um, I think it's um, it, it's an important program and uh, it's something that will um, be very important to our country in terms of growth, development, economy, etc. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is I think we're almost at the end of the, um, the questions. Um, I will then open the mic for, for people that want to verbally uh, ask a question. Uh, so that person that's concerned about Pakisa can um, can talk about that. Um, 
this uh, this is question not for you it says would registering with a trust satisfy the need of the child being registered for homeschooling the answer is no that you don't register with a trust you join the trust we are not a registration authority uh, we provide a service to to resolve conflict between homeschooling parents and 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 uh, government officials um soon i'm sure government will understand that uncapped on Education is a form of education and there's evidence of learning. Parents can prove that their children have learned. I think that's a very valid point. Um, we, we can have some discussion of what will be viewed as evidence of learning. So, so various people use various educational uh, approaches that are totally different from CAPS. Um, and, and maybe they will be are willing to provide evidence of learning, um, but it will not be sort of what CAPS requires. Have you got any comment on that? Well, um, you know, as I say, uh, for me, from what I've seen, if we want to, if, if, if we want to move in that direction, we need to have a starting point of moving in that direction, because the chances are that you're not, unless you are the majority, you're not going to actually um, throw out the majority's uh, policy or thinking. So, but you can mold that policy and thinking to accommodate what you want to achieve whilst you think about putting the majority of people who think like you in, into, into government so that there, there's a greater understanding of where homeschoolers are in terms of what outcomes they want, what they want to achieve. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, always aware that there's, um, we are such a diverse nation and we've got such inequality and there's, you know, Sometimes a homeschooling um, community is very aware of who they are as parents and how protective they are of their children and how they support their children and, and how, um, how their children have great value in actually learning from them. But there are huge numbers of people in this country who do not have that kind of family structure or anything like that. And the protections, you can't just take those protections away from everybody. And, and no government can guess who needs or doesn't need that. So there needs to be just some basics. And my, my thoughts have always been um, that, we, that we need to move in the direction of freeing families as much as possible to make those decisions that they want to make for their family. But we've got to start by understanding what is the reality? What do we have? What is now? We can't pretend what we have we don't have. We know what we have. We start there and we say, okay, there's so much we want to change. But with the situation as it is, what do we think we have the best chance of gaining? How do we, what ground could we gain? And we focus on gaining that ground because we can, we, we, with a sense that we can convince people that this is non-threatening, this is important to everybody, this is not going to disadvantage anybody, let's get that space. So, so it's working very strategically and not trying to, um, what, Rome wasn't built in a day. You, you know, so you, you really, and, and, and you, we keep knowing, if we keep taking steps forward and we keep take, moving towards the ideal, that's going to be great. Um, one big revolution it usually becomes bloody. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, next question. I think there's a short one. Can the draft policy be implemented before the Bella Bill? Now, I think the answer to that is uh, yes, it can. That's an internal um, uh, policy of the department. They can. They they don't need to wait for Parliament. It is obviously a very problematic policy because it, it, it refers to the old legislation and the new legislation that hasn't even been to Parliament. So they've assumed Parliament will just rubber stamp what, um, what will be in Bella Bull, so that makes the policy very problematic. But uh, in, in theory, it can be implemented before the bill. And, and this is the value in, in not making that committee your enemy before you need to, because that committee can actually be those people that will ensure that um, there is no pushing of the department's agenda onto parliament and that parliament remain um, those people that are there to voice 
the concerns of, of, of the people of South Africa and not just the concerns, but actually express in our legislation how the people of South Africa want to live and how they want to, um, well, how important, the things that are important to them, the values that are important to them, how we need to express that within the legislation. And I think you, you've got a good chance in the beginning of any committee of understanding that these are ordinary people who are usually mothers and fathers as well, and they they have some sense of family, and, and we need to like carefully approach these people from that perspective in terms of, of uh, getting their thinking and not making, putting them on the defensive, not making them feel threatened or that there's some kind of revolution about to take place and, <laughs> and, and crazy thinking. Okay, another short one is how does one get a slot to speak at the hearing parliamentary and national council of provinces? I assume there will be public announcements or something like that. Yes, it will be advertised. There will be public announcements. We, of course, as a party, will be watching out for that. And so we'll be putting it out there as well. And so obviously your organizations will, will be alert to these things and have your ears and eyes in the right <laughs> places. Our, con uh, our um, PAs in our offices at Parliament and the ACDP offices, they will always be able to um, be contacted in terms of asking for a program of Parliament. You could also look on the Parliament website to keep a track of what what is being put onto the program, what bills are before the house, these kind of things. So that's all public knowledge that's all there. And, and our um, sort of assistants are in our offices and they're able to help you as well and put you on the right track in terms of getting that information. Yeah, and I think... Um, so th then you, then you you put in your written submission and um, copy the ACDP so that when we actually go into those committees to discuss those things, we're aware of, of where the concerns are so that we can check that when we come to talk about that particular clause, we, we know that this clause is being queried and, and, and we, we keep an eye on it. Okay. I'm also, and I think a number of us are on Lou Ellen Brown's mailing list. That will keep us very informed. Um, so Llewellyn is the committee and he's very good at keeping yeah. everybody in. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, um, uh, uh, this looks like the, the last one. Uh, most other proportional representative representation parliaments governed by coalition. Can smaller parties then have outsized influence? 29 election may result in a need for coalitions in a if ANC falls below 50%. So, yes, could that give small parties more power? Yes, the, the, the ACDP has shown itself willing to act in the interests of the people of South Africa in terms of forming a coalition if we want to take the power out of the hands of, of any government at any time that is not uh, proving to be as effective and efficient as they need to be. So um, we, we have committed to that. Um, the, 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 the thing there that I would say is, remember that when you form that kind of a coalition, whoever is in the majority in that coalition will have the most influence, which means that if it's a super liberal party like the DA, they will have, they will not have the thinking of the average person with a biblical worldview, which means that that doesn't make them good, bad, or ugly. It actually just makes them the DA. But um, it is important to know that putting your vote with that, that grouping is problematic. You need to put your vote with people who have the right mindset that you have, so that when they are in that coalition, they have a greater influence, that their vote is far more necessary in terms of um, when, when people are compromising and saying, well, if we're having that, then we want this, et cetera, et cetera. You've got the bargaining power because you've got the numbers and they need your vote. Um, and that's going to be important. So people must know that um, replacing one super liberal party with another super liberal party, even if they've got a few little other parties attached to them, is not going to actually make any difference in terms of your worldview and, and the, the issues that are important to you and the freedom that you want to see people have in terms of bringing their family up in the beliefs and the understanding that those people have. Okay, I'm, I'm at the end of the, the list of questions. I think, uh, so I'm going to give somebody the um, opportunity to um, 
unmute himself and ask the question. There is some, I think the person that's that's concerned about Pakisa, I think, uh, can you explain your concerns and then uh, Cheryl and Dudley can respond to that? Hi, Cheryl, and it's Pauline here. Um, I think um, there was an article um, that was uh, shared on the, the Bella Bills group a while back regarding um, Operation Pakisa as being um, a vehicle through which data harvesting of our children was going to take place. So I can forward that um, article to you, um, and maybe that's the the easiest way to, to deal with it at the moment, given that you don't have that same information that, that we amongst the homeschoolers um, have at this stage. Yeah, for, for that article, but also just highlight the, the, the parts of that article that have stood out for you and just mention why, why you feel that could be a problem. Um, and what, 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 your con you know, what, what it is about that that, that raises your concern. I think it's... Um, <clears throat> That, that perhaps some of the, um, the the thrust behind the Bella Bill was to uh, have homeschoolers registered um, so that they can be plugged into a program that we as homeschoolers wouldn't necessarily want our children to be plugged into um, for the purposes of, of data harvesting. That was going to extend, um, you know, well into adulthood. Um, I'm probably not the best person to to really um, be uh, asking this question, so I'm I'm not sure if there's others that can can uh, word it better than than I can. Um, but I think that was the the main concern that there might be some um, underlying um, motive or agenda by the DBE to uh, plug homeschool the home education community into that program. Um, yeah. And, and I think uh, one of the concerns came up in the, the uh, policy, the draft policy on home education, where it referred to um, each homeschooling, uh, each homeschooler or, or the homeschooling uh, environment being given a site number and um, yeah, each, each child on that site being given um, a number, obviously. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was a data harvesting concern. Yeah, okay, that look interesting and, and we're in an incredibly interesting world because we're talking about that uh, fourth revolution, industrial, or the industrial revolution, that the fourth revolution not being industrial, it will be actually to do with um, robots and technology and whatever. And of course, the, the, the understanding is that children who are in school right now are not going to actually have anywhere like the information or the skills that they're going to need to get a job um, when they're at, uh, at a place where they're going to be looking for a job. So it's moving that kind of fast. So I think obviously governments globally are all looking at how do we start helping schools tap into preparing um, our children now, right from the early phases, um, for the, the new world that we've, we've entered actually, and that, that is overtaking us and uh, overtaking our job markets. So I think a lot of that is to do with making sure that nobody gets left out. So it's, so it's not a, a, um, a, an evil scheme. What it is is, if there's if there's dangers and threats within that scheme to help people then we need to bring that up and we need to say but this is this um if we do this this opens us to this and then how can we actually minimize that that negative influence so if we can start looking at not saying no we're not going to enter this we're going to let our kids be um what, unable to be employed um, in the next few years, um, that doesn't make sense to people in this day and age. But what does make sense is we give them this, then we have this problem. How can we how can we make this problem less likely? So, so we need to put regulations in place and, and, and things in place to, to that, that are like a safeguard. Nothing, of course, is going to be perfect. Everybody's trying to do the best. But my, my appeal is that we argue these things in a way that is helpful so that we don't actually make ourselves the enemy of normal society 
or the, the lunatics or the crazy people, that we actually say we get this, we, we get what's happening in the world, we understand, we want our kids to be um, ready for these, the, these challenges, but we don't want them to be open to these dangers. Um, how, how, how can we best um, ensure that? And we can work together on that. And, I, and I've proved with that one piece of legislation that went through the National Assembly that we can actually do this. It's possible. People want to hear, people want to listen if they don't perceive you to be the enemy and they actually trust that you are wanting the best for them as well as for yourself. Yeah. Right. Could... Thank you, Cheryl. I'm sorry, I've got some of that, but uh, because the, the connection's not great, but I get the gist of it and I really appreciate your. your... Thank you. Let me, let me give you my email. It's simple cdudley at parliament.gov.za. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, great. Bye. Okay, so I can just uh, yet clarify something that, that Pauline said is uh, it's it's not as much in in Bella Bill, but there are lots of things in the policy that if if you ask now why do they put this thing in the policy, then the the only answer I can give them is well because the computer system works like that. So it's got nothing to do with the best interests of the child. It's got everything to do with that's how the computer system works and you've got to fall in line with that. Um, coming from the IT industry, I can yet recognize that uh, yet very clearly. Okay, I think there are no... Uh, find the solution to that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we need to, uh, need to articulate it in a way that other people will get it. Because if it's fixable, people want to fix it. But if it's... You, you, you know, so if there's a, if there is a solution, um, the, the people I have worked with over the years want to find that solution. Um, they just don't want to not fix something because it may be a problem. Yeah. But if there's a solution, we we, we can work towards that. Okay, there's a, another quick question here. Uh, I think so. We're talking about laws and. We, laws and bills but then there are also regulations so there's a question uh, where do regulations come from and how do they come into being for example regulations that has got a massive impact on education or the regulations around the administration of matric where the regulation says you must do grade 10 11 and 12 in order to get your matric certificate and because of that regulation people fall out of the school system in grade 10 and it's impossible then to get a matric so that regulation alone has put yet cancelled the future of millions of young people in this country so regulations are important and we don't know where they come from yeah so that that particular problem is is an interesting one that i, I like to sort of chat through how, how we could actually address something like that. But just to say regulation is, um, is the function of the department and the minister. So, but, but Parliament wants to oversee those regulations because obviously when we put um, legislation in place, we want the regulations to uh, effectively, to, to make that law implementable in a way that it's actually going to achieve what it was meant to achieve. So we have a great interest in those regulations. Um, the difficulty is that we only have 12 months in a year and, 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 and that's like the, the hopeless impossible task that we have. But if we do, if there is a problem with regulations, um, that can be brought to the attention of, of um, the committee. But now what is open to members of parliament is, um, like we said, that, that uh, situation of a private member's bill. Well, let's, let's backtrack. Let's say what is open from the beginning. First of all, is asking a question of the department. Is the department aware that the impact of that regulation is this, that, and the other? And has it been discussed? Is it being considered? Um, you, you, what, getting some kind of uh, to and fro in terms of getting the department to understand, if for us to understand if the department does see it as a problem or has considered or hasn't, and then we know where to go from there. There can also be, for example, we could bring a, um, uh, uh, we could call for a debate in the House. So if we feel that this is something of public interest, we can call for a debate. We word it in a way that it's not um, contentious, 
so that all parties want to buy into that debate. And then we then it's great because then you can lobby different parties in terms of what your thinking is on that. And, and that should come through in that debate and it creates a greater awareness. Um, then there's also the, the private members bill uh, situation, which of course is a much bigger work. But this is where I would say something like this is important because that regulation has come because there's space in that legislation for that regulation to be made. Now, there may be, there, there may be a need to change something in that legislation that would create the space, that would stop that um, space, close that space for that regulation. So that would be... Uh, and there'd have to be good reasons for that, and it would have to be constitutional, and it would have to be good for everybody in the country and not just for, for a few. But at the same time, we also must take care of the few so that we don't want to see that. The, so even if you can't make it for everybody, you can actually make it where it's not going to affect the minority grouping. So I'm thinking that would that possibly be a good issue to focus in on and see, okay, there's a lot we can't do, but what could we do about this? How, how could we bring something that we could honestly argue as not only constitutional, but good for the country um, in terms of our dropout rate, this, that, the other, you know, all of the things that, that we know that the department would want to fix and that the majority, majority party would want to fix. Um, and, and I think we'd stand a good chance. So that's possibly a, a place to start um, with, with um, drafting a private members bill. Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, so there are, seem to be, we've covered most of the questions. Uh, Christopher has put your email address on the chat group. So if you want to send the, the email to Sherilyn, uh, you can do that. Uh, yeah, he, he, here's a question, how to fight draft regulations. But there's no public participation process with regulation, so we can't fight it. So you can only fight it in court. Is that? Uh... Well, you, you, there's that, but there's also the fact of bringing it up as asking the department, uh, because and, and starting to just to work to see if you can bring an awareness to the department about what the problems are, what they're not, whatever, and and and, and start to deal with it from that from that angle. Um, it, it's a lot of it is about what the policies are of the majority um, party that's in government. And I think so a lot of attention needs to be paid to that kind of thing. And you'll notice that larger parties, when they go to elections, they'll have slogans like fight back and you won't actually hear much about the policies. Um, and smaller parties will end up giving you screeds of information about their policy on things which will shut these people up and shut those people out. <laughs> but it's important for people to look at those policies and actually um, get a sense of whether you need to put your weight behind these people because when they are the government, um, are they going to understand the issues that are important to you? Are they going to see the world the way you see the world and have the best chance of considering um, the, the, the suggestions and the, the space that, that families, that family-centered people need to bring up their families the way they want to? Thank you very much. So I don't want to go to two hours. I think uh, it, it's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, this this webinar I've learned a lot and I'm sure everybody in this group has learned a lot um, so we are making a recording of this so this recording will be made available I'm not sure how but I will uh, uh, let you know um, so Sherilyn I want to thank you very much for your time and 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 getting to and also yet um, having a test run done and everything I really appreciate this, and I think everybody else appreciates it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, clearly we've learned a lot as well in terms of the test, but I want to make one little appeal, and that is if you keep me bogged down with becoming a researcher on every subject and article going, I won't be able to do anything. Uh -huh. So condense what you want to know into what's important and why, and then I can act quickly on it. So, so because I, what, what happens is people send you 50,000 pages of things to read through, et cetera, and you can yeah. imagine how that sort of 
utilizes you. So I don't need to become the expert in this subject. What I need to know is that you're the expert, whoever sends me, and, and, and this is where you see the problem and this is what you'd like done about it. Thank you. And it's been wonderful being with you and it's, uh, it's great. And call me when you, you, you want to chat about something else. Thank you very much. So there are lots of people on the chat window that also say thank you. So uh, on oh, behalf of everyone. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Good night. You too. Bye.